Uh, good morning. Um, now we move to our last author um, in this course to Emil Durkheim. <coughs> uh, there are really two Durkheims. Uh, we have seen certainly two Marxes and two uh, Webers. Uh, there are also two faces of Emil Durkheim. Uh, to put it bluntly, uh, the young Durkheim uh, has been a functionalist and a positivist. And then, late in his life, uh, he has his epistemological turn. He became a cultural analyst. Well, it's not quite true because, you know, uh, each author is more complex and there were already elements of his culturalism in the early work, but there was certainly a dramatic change in the way how Durkheim conceived the, um, what, what the job of social sciences later in his life in his uh, book, uh, The Elementary Forms of Religious Life. I think it had a lot to do also with his personal life, and we will talk about this. Um, he was uh, uh, brought up in a rabbinical family and was supposed to become a rabbi. And then he revolted against the parental household, uh, much like Nietzsche did, uh, turned probably into an atheist, but certainly not an active believer in Judaism. And later in his life, um, he became again interested in religion and not only uh, philosophically, but uh, also existentially interested in religion. Um, well, uh, in the course, uh, we have only four lectures on Durkheim, so I leave uh, Durkheim, the culturalist, uh, out, and we will doing a work only on his uh, earlier work, uh, uh, The Division of Labor, uh, uh, the wonderful book Suicide, and a somewhat difficult book, uh, The Rules of Sociological Method. Uh, um, and I, uh, I just leave uh, um, the elementary form of religious life. I don't have time to fit this into. Uh, Durkheim had an extraordinary impact on uh, uh, American social science. Um, initially, it was particularly the younger Durkheim, the functionalist Durkheim, who had uh, such an extraordinary impact. Um, uh, unlike uh, uh, Weber or Marx, whose impact was broad um, and affected history and uh, economics uh, and political science, Durkheim's impact was much more focused on sociology. So in this course, the only author who, properly speaking, is a sociologist is Emil Durkheim. All the others you discussed um, uh, were not really identified themselves as sociologists. Later in his life, Weber did, uh, but uh, not uh, 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 on the whole. Emil Durkheim uh, uh, identified himself and his project as a, a sociology. Uh, it, of course, has a lot, lot to do that these uh, disciplinary boundaries between economics, political science, and sociology became much more sharply drawn by the end of 19th and early 20th century. Um, and uh, sociology as an academic discipline was really established by uh, the late 19th century. So this is Emil Durkheim, born in 1858 and died in 1917. Just very briefly about his life, he was born in a small town, Epinal in France. As I said, his uh, father was a rabbi and uh, uh, he was expected to become a rabbi himself. Uh, in 79, he was admitted to the École Normale Supérieure, uh, which is one of these very elite schools, MIT, uh, uh, version in France uh, and uh, uh, by the time he went to uh, university, um, Ecole Normale Supérieure, 
his uh, uh, university, uh, uh, he lost his religious beliefs. Um, uh, he was uh, uh, for some time a professor at the University of Bordeaux. Uh, then he became politically active in the 1940s, um, especially in the so-called Dreyfus Affair, and I will just briefly mention what that was. Uh, uh, then 1902, uh, he became professor at the University of Paris, which is not quite as distinguished as Ecole Normale Supérieure. Uh, uh, his son was killed uh, in the war, and shortly after this, he died in Paris. So this is Alfred Dreyfus. Uh, this is a very important event uh, in French and in many ways in European history. What was the Dreyfus affair? You probably all know. In 1894, Dreyfus, who was uh, uh, Jewish, uh, was uh, uh, falsely accused to be a German spy, and it was uh, 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 imprisoned. Uh, that was uh, obviously um, an anti-Semitic trial, and this mobilized the French intellectuals, and not only French intellectuals, uh, but uh, 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 French intellectuals in particular. Um, Emile Zola, uh, whom some of you may have read, uh, the leading French writer of this e epoch, wrote um, an important article which appeared in um, the uh, French, uh, leading French daily newspaper, Jacques, um, I accuse um, the French judiciary of being anti-Semitic. Well, Durkheim joined uh, other prominent French intellectuals to protest the trial. It took them a long time, but eventually they were successful. Dreyfus was uh, eventually exonerated of all charges and uh, made the knight of the Legion of Honor. So it was uh, a happy ending of French anti-Semitism uh, for a while. Then it came back with vengeance. Uh, um, during uh, the occupation, Nazi occupation. French are not as innocent about anti-Semitism as you may want to believe it. Uh, uh, many were collaborating with the Nazis. Well, th about the work, in 1993 he wrote a dissertation, uh, which probably is still his most influential book, The Division of Labor in Society, and today's lecture will be focused on this. Uh, 95, it was followed by the Rules of Sociological Method, uh, which is uh, his most positivistic statement. The Division of Labor is his most functionalist work. Um, and then uh, in 97, he wrote Suicide. Uh, Suicide is a very important book because it's really the first piece of rigorous empirical social science, which takes a very um, uh, unusual, very rare uh, so phenomena like suicide and uh, uh, crunches numbers extremely carefully to test whether he can identify social determinants of such a rare phenomenon. Uh, fortunately, uh, even in countries where many people commit suicide, uh, it's still a rare phenomenon. Uh, it's, uh, but he managed to come up with a very provocative theory what he um, uh, uh, demonstrated with very careful empirical analysis. We will be uh, looking at uh, two parts of the division of labor. Um, today we will be looking at uh, uh, the major arguments of division of labor. Um, 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 and then uh, also we will look at, uh, uh, at uh, uh, Thursday on his theory of anomy. Uh, which is a central piece of the book, Division of Labor, um, uh, but uh, 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 a kind of, uh, uh, by the way, uh, uh, analysis. Uh, um, uh, 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 and as I said, in 1915, he wrote uh, um, this book, The Elementary Forms of Religious Life, which is a major break uh, in his work uh, uh, and shows his renewed interest uh, in the spiritual and the metaphysical. Okay, uh, uh, just uh, very briefly what is in the books. As I said, 
the Division of Labor was his PhD dissertation. But unlike many uh, 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 scholars whose uh, only good book is their dissertation, um, Durkheim followed it up with a number of good other books. Um, uh, many uh, professors are actually one book people, or at least they should have been, because their only good book was the dissertation, and what they published later, only published uh, because publish or perish, right, to get tenure. That's why they probably published too many books. Um, anyway, um, he was inspired by Montesquieu. Um, uh, well, Durkheim is very French, uh, and his roots are deeply in Montesquieu, and to some extent in Rousseau. Uh, he admired Rousseau as well. But Montesquieu is really uh, the uh, major um, inspiration behind him. And, uh, well, what he does, he uses law as a measure of social development, uh, uh, much like Montesquieu did, sort of, uh, um, uh, um, uh, and uh, uh, he explains uh, uh, by using the law, uh, the legal system, um, uh, uh, how um, uh, the division of labor evolved, uh, what were the stages of the development of division of labor. Well, uh, uh, just a very brief uh, contrast, right? Uh, Marx was interested in economic conflict, right? In struggle around uh, um, uh, scarce economic resources. Weber was interested in struggle for power, so was Nietzsche. Durkheim was interested in social solidarity. Um, uh, Marx and Weber are conflict theorists. They try to explain what breaks up society. Um, Durkheim uh, is a theorist uh, uh, which tries to understand what holds society together, what brings us together, uh, why society is not falling apart. Uh, right. Well, uh, in the book, he makes a crucial distinction between two types of solidarity, mechanical and organic solidarity. Um, and uh, uh, I will speak about this uh, uh, at great length. This is an other attempt to develop a typology of evolution of societies. You are already familiar with Marx's modes of production, right? The evolution from slavery to feudalism to capitalism. You are familiar with Max Weber, traditional authority and legal rational authority. Now Durkheim's alternative is mechanical and organic solidarity, right? What uh, Weber called traditional authority is kind of mechanical solidarity for Durkheim or what Marx called um, pre-capitalist formations is mechanical solidarity. Organic solidarity describes legal rational authority or uh, modernity or capitalism. Uh, <coughs> uh, he also identified the pathological, pathological forms of division of labor, uh, and this is what he called anomie. And his idea of anomie is a kind of similar or uh, analogous distinction what was, what was alienation in Marx and what was disenchantment in Weber. Uh, although there are very important differences uh, as well, and I will be talking about this Thursday. Now on suicide, as I said, this is one of the first very rigorous empirical studies of a social phenomenon, a phenomenon we think is not quite social, we think it is really an individual decision whether you take your life or not. Uh, but Durkheim actually was capable to show that even in this very private action, when you take your life, there are social determinants uh, who, who is committing suicide or not. And he is making a distinction between different types of suicide, anomic, altruistic, egoistic, and fatalistic ones and I will be talking about this uh, uh, after you return from Thanksgiving's break. Now about the methodology. He was a methodological collectivist, much like Montesquieu or Rousseau, and very much unlike Hobbes, Locke or Mills. You know, Marx being kind of halfway between methodological individualism and collectivism. As a theorist of revolutionary consciousness, 
He was a, revolution, a, a, a methodological collectivist. We will see uh, uh, Durkheim's notion of collective conscience is not all that different from Weber's uh, Marx idea of class consciousness, which is not the sum total, right, of the individual consciousness of workers. Uh, uh, but uh, Marx, in his theory of exploitation, as you have read his text, uh, reads almost like Adam Smith or John Stuart Mill, right? Uh, it's uh, self-interested rational individuals from which he explains the nature of exploitation. Uh, well, it's much more difficult to figure out how um, Weber fits into these categories. I think he's also vacillating between collectivism and individualism. Later in his life, is becoming more of a methodological individualism. But Durkheim, the consistency in Durkheim is that from day one, he's a methodological collectivist and remains a methodological collectivist. But at the same time, he believed in the existence of social facts. Um, and the social facts, on the other hand, can be observed with rigorous empirical methodology. Uh, and this is what makes him, uh, in, in a way, a positivist. So this is a, uh, just a brief uh, introduction to uh, who the author is. And now let me move uh, to the division of labor. Uh, and... Uh, Well, my computer is getting slower as uh, the semester is progressing, so it's probably time for the semester to end because my laptop, though it is new, it still uh, will become unbearably slow by the end of the semester. Okay, so this is Emil Durkheim and the division of labor in society. So how does uh, Durkheim proceed um, in the work? And uh, uh, today's uh, presentation will focus uh, uh, on the question why Durkheim begins the analysis uh, uh, by taking the law um, as uh, the point of departure. Um, uh, and uh, 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 then uh, we will uh, proceed how he makes the distinction between organic uh, and uh, um, uh, um, uh, mechanical solidarity. Um, uh, so uh, the question actually is for a methodological collectivist uh, 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 that you need to find um, some collective um, expression um, in order to study society, not individuals. And uh, much like Montesquieu, um, he be, uh, believes that uh, the law um, is such a collective phenomenon, a law which uh, um, uh, can be studied and established without studying individual views or individual opinions, right? Uh, it's uh, uh, parts of uh, what, uh, the, you know, uh, Durkheim's terminology is the collective conscience, uh, um, uh, which is uh, above uh, individual consciousnesses. Uh, okay, so that's um, uh, 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 what, what are the most important uh, issues uh, um, in, in the work, we, uh, what, uh, as far as we discuss it today. Uh, well, he is uh, interested in, in solidarity. Um, as I pointed out, uh, uh, um, uh, we are, uh, uh, his, his real question is, what holds society together? We are so different, society should fall apart. Right? He is uh, writing in the late 19th, early 20th century. Um, this is the time of industrialization, of urbanization. People are dislodged from their um, traditional communities, from the traditional villages, uh, pushed away from 
peasant agriculture and move into urban industrial employment. And, and uh, the question is, um, will society break down? So, will social order break down um, if uh, the traditional order does not keep us together? And this is what he tries to figure out. What in a modern urban and industrial society can uh, keep us together? And he tries to find uh, solidarity. And, uh, uh, well, uh, 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 what creates this uh, uh, solidarity uh, is uh, collective consciousness. Uh, um, and the fundamental idea about in Durkheim about collective consciousness, uh, as I said, it is uh, analogous to the notion of the general will um, uh, in uh, uh, Rousseau, or uh, the notion of class consciousness uh, in Marx. Uh, so, therefore, it is not the sum total of uh, individual consciousnesses, uh, but uh, something uh, uh, of uh, shared norms, beliefs, and values uh, which uh, exist prior an individual is being born, prior uh, society actually existed, which is passed on from one generation to the other, right? And uh, uh, therefore, he tries to show, right, these collective consciousnesses which uh, persist over time. Um, and, uh, of course, the most obvious, uh, uh, most rigorous way to go about is to uh, look at law, because that's exactly what the law is, um, right? The law um, uh, is changing over time, but usually uh, the change is very, very slow and reaches over several generations. Uh, uh, so uh, for somebody who is a, a French social scientist, you know, and one unique field, uh, we already uh, talked about this, uh, well, uh, uh, the French are very methodological collectivists. The Anglo-Saxons tend to be methodological individualists. Um, and the French, unlike the German, um, are very scientific. They are very much scientists. Um, uh, the word uh, scientific uh, in German does not exist. Uh, the Germans say, ich bin ein Wissenschaftler. Wissenschaft means uh, um, uh, Wissen is knowledge. Uh, 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 so, uh, science in German is constituted by all sorts of knowledge, right? It's a much broader notion, right? In French or in English, with science, we really mean rigorous science uh, of the natural science types. Now, that's, uh, Durkheim did not go as far as saying it is natural science, but certainly he was very scientific um, in insistence of rigorous analysis uh, of uh, objective data, right? That's what... Uh, 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 by the Germans, you know, Wissenschaftler, all those who um, uh, study ideas uh, are Wissenschaftlers. It's a much, much, much broader notion. Uh, natural scientists are also Wissenschaftlers, but people who study humanities and history of ideas are also Wissenschaftlers. Uh, people who are an expert on Hobbes and spend their life writing on Hobbes is a Wissenschaftler, right, in German. We can hardly say somebody who does, right, history of ideas to be a scientist, right? It's, uh, 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 we are iffy. We, we call it, you know, humanities. Um, we talk about social sciences uh, uh, with a lot of anxiety. And real scientists ask us, social science? What do you mean? What is science about what you are doing? Well, those of you who take economics, they make sure it looks like science because you have all the equations on the blackboard. So therefore, you know, a scientist can relax. But you, if you are listening to my lectures and not a single equation um, on the blackboard, you probably have doubt that this is really social science. Anyway, he was uh, scientific in sense of being very rigorous in his analysis. Sort of what is collective consciousness? I give uh, here uh, uh, a, a, a citation for you, right? Uh, um, uh, it is uh, 
a totality of beliefs and sentiments uh, which are common to the average member of society, right? But which has a life of its own, right? Uh, uh, that's what he calls uh, a collective uh, 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 consciousness. So this is uh, uh, different from the consciousnesses of the individuals, though, you know, he, he's, a, he's a scientist, uh, right? He's scientific. Uh, it is, has to be realized in individuals. So therefore, I mean, Durkheim uh, would not necessarily be opposed uh, uh, to carry out even survey research and ask individuals about their customs or values and sort of aggregate this up and try to find those patterns, especially over time and across nations. That's not r really what he did. But I think he would be open for this kind of, uh, of research, which of course made him so influential in early American sociology in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, because uh, um, American uh, sociology has been very uh, positivist and very empirical. Well, uh, but the most obvious example of collective conscience is uh, the law, probably also the language. Well, uh, there are differences uh, in law in uh, pre-modern and modern societies. Uh, now we are getting into his uh, building the argument up to make the distinction between organic and uh, um, uh, uh, mechanical, mechanical and organic solidarity. Um, and uh, uh, let me just uh, uh, go through of this. Uh, uh, oops, uh, went too far. Okay. Um, so, uh, in, uh, the, the, the argument is that in, in pre-modern societies, uh, uh, the, the law which existed is uh, primarily a repressive or penal law. Um, uh, well, that, uh, you know, that is uh, uh, the purpose of punishment is to punish evil behavior. And uh, we tend to agree what is evil behavior is... Uh, um, and punishments, therefore, also tends to be harsh uh, to uh, prevent uh, further um, uh, aggressive behavior um, uh, by uh, in, in individuals. Uh, 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 so th this is uh, the legal system of pre-modern societies. Well, I will give you a couple of citations, uh, and I won't read them. Uh, I will put them on the internet and you can read it at, uh, at your leisure. It kind of elaborates uh, on, on the points uh, uh, what I, I made. Um, uh, uh, okay, uh, but in modern society, uh, uh, the legal system is very different. Uh, the legal system is uh, based on contract. The essence of modern legal system is contract. That's not that we do not have a penal code, right? The penal code survives, but what is no a novel is uh, 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 contractual uh, law, uh, which is restitutive, uh, which is not about punishing evil, but simply restitute the damage somebody by breaking a contract caused to the other contracting partner, right? And he said, well, this is a new type of law which emerges uh, uh, with uh, modernity. Uh, Marx would say uh, it is a, a, a new legal system uh, which uh, emerges uh, with, legal, uh, with, with capitalism. Uh, um, and uh, Weber will say this is uh, the essence of legal rational authority. Uh, uh, um, Well, uh, oh, why does he study law? Uh, I don't want to elaborate on this too long. Uh, uh, that's uh, uh, obvious that uh, the legal system is uh, the single best measure of what he, he tries to get at collective conscience, which can be studied the most objectively, right? There are law books and legal practices and 
uh, uh, minutes of uh, uh, recordings, how the courts operated and how law was uh, made and implemented, which can be studied with great level of um, uh, rigor. Um, uh, uh, for instance, it's very easy to study whether indeed contractual law um, is a new form of law. Uh, you can go back to legal history and to establish exactly when contractual law um, emerged. This was actually also uh, very much on the mind of uh, uh, the young uh, Weber uh, when he was uh, also looking at basically the emergence of contractual law in late medieval Italy um, in his uh, uh, PhD for the law degree. Uh, 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 I think I already made this point, what is interesting, that uh, Durkheim and Weber sort of ignored each other. Um, uh, I don't think they ever cited each other. I, I don't recall ever seeing a citation to one uh, uh, another. Though they were working on the same area, of course they both uh, sp did speak both of the languages and they were, of course, aware that the other giant exists. They were probably in many ways too close, um, too much in competition with each other to cite each other. I mentioned already that uh, Durkheim did review Mariana Weber's book, but never any of Weber's book. Though Mariana was writing right about ma marital law, marriage law, uh, which was a marginal interest to Durkheim, and Weber was writing on religion, which was so central for Durkheim's interest, and nevertheless. Uh, they kind of um, uh, ignored each other. Now, uh, about the two types of solidarity. Uh, well, uh, mechanical solidarity, uh, it's uh, well, hard to uh, remember the distinction. One would think organic solidarity must be old, right, and mechanical must be modern, the machines. Now, the opposite is true. I I kept making these mistakes for the first two or three years when I was reading Durkheim some 45 years ago. Uh, well, uh, uh, mechanical solidarity is uh, 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 which describes uh, pre-modern pre societies. Uh, um, and uh, this is a solidarity which based on the similarities uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of, 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 of the parts. Uh, um, well, this is uh, why you can have a, um, a, a penal law, because a penal law does not make a distinction between contractual partners. Uh, it assumes the sameness uh, of the group as such. Uh, uh, and uh, 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 mechanical uh, solidarity, uh, uh, right, uh, is, uh, as I said, is primarily based that we, are, we, we see, see ourselves similar. Uh, in, in the group. Organic so solidarity, uh, so will Durkheim argue, is one which is based uh, on differences uh, in society. A higher level of division of labor in society uh, produces organic solidarity. Organic, he means it is a kind of biological analogy. A modern society is like the human body, right? There are functional differences between the human organs. That's why it is organic solidarity, right? The heart performs a different function than the lung, but the lung could not live without the heart, right? This is why this is organic soli solidarity. Society operates more like an organism. Um, in uh, earlier times, society was more operating like a machine where you actually a part is taken out mechanically. It doesn't matter all that much, right? It is a simple machine, uh, uh, I mean. So that's, uh, that's the fundamental distinction. By the way, also for Durkheim, uh, uh, and this is also in the text, uh, what you are reading, this distinction between mechanical and organic solidarity is uh, uh, developed in order to describe uh, societies as such. But much like uh, uh, Weber's notion of traditional authority and legal rational authority, uh, he is also using this to understand uh, 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 society, uh, social solidarities in contemporary life. So 
me mechanical solidarity does exist um, in, uh, um, in contemporary uh, society as well. And he makes, you know, this reference to uh, finding uh, um, um, a marital partner uh, whom, whom, whom we want to date with uh, and whom we uh, uh, consider to marry. Uh, um, occasionally, we, are, uh, uh, we, we try to find somebody who is more similar than we are. Um, and uh, people will say, well, uh, you look like, uh, if you are heterosexual, like brothers and sisters. Uh, or if you are uh, gay, then you look like brothers or you look like sisters, right? You look same, you, you look, look similar. And that can be, right, a consideration uh, for a lasting partnership. I'm trying to find somebody who likes the same stuff what I like, who is like me, right? But it can be the opposite as well, right? You may be looking for a person, you know, you may follow the logic of organic solidarity, right? Uh, you may be looking for a person who will complement you, right? Uh, I'm bad in co uh, keeping the books, uh, uh, and, and therefore uh, what I'm trying to look for right, is somebody who will balance the checkbook, right? Um, uh, so occasionally looking for a partner, we are looking for somebody uh, who will uh, uh, complement us. Now that describes, uh, right, modern society with a higher level of division of labor. Division of labor, he says, can bring us uh, together, um, uh, much like uh, the bodily organism, that we are performing different functions in society, we complement um, each other, we need each other on the basis of our differences rather than our similarities. Uh, um, uh, and in fact, the contractual law expresses the spirit uh, uh, of organic solidarity as such. Well, uh, Durkheim will uh, show us that there is uh, in fact uh, uh, a, a lot of trouble in the transition from from mechanical to organic solidarity. Uh, and this is what he will call anomie uh, in the transition from uh, mechanical to organic solidarity, moving from a traditional society to a modern society. Our value system breaks down. We find ourselves in the situation of anomie, uh, but this is a topic I will be talking about uh, uh, Thursday. Thank you very much.